Good morning, everybody. Look at this here. That big shire horse there in the middle, for some reason, and there's our van there, right in front of the window, always chooses to, to roll over on her, on her back and kind of roll around right there in front of us. And then there's a little one that looks just like that one that does the same thing in the same place. They roll over on the back and it just looks so cute. They, they, look, they look so happy when they do it. Anyway, uh, on the Zoom groups this week, I'm cutting the questions down. Um, I think they're, they're more thought-provoking questions, but uh, there's only five. Um, the idea is to give more time to pray at the end. Okay, so for the first question, can we just read Psalm 37, verses 3 to 4, also Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3, and Acts 4, verse 9. So the main verse that we're looking at is Acts 4, verse 9, and just a couple of illustrations, Psalm 37, verses 3 to 4, Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3. Okay, so the question is, has anybody ever done you good? Like, just kind of really surprised you with something. They, they did you good. How did that make you feel? And also, how did that change your perception about them? Remember, this whole thing begins with a good deed. Uh, the, whatever way you want to look at it that's what Peter says that it was to the Sanhedrin this is a good deed what was done to the man was a good deed and there's many many ways that we can do people good not just one way not just healing many many ways that we can do people good the Bible says that Jesus went around doing good and the Psalm 37 talks about the same thing so my question is has anybody in this life ever done you good really kind of surprised you really kind of taking you off your guard a bit how did that make you feel and how did that change your perception of them just show you this for a minute just over there right over there it's a funny angle this angle is but on top of that hill there is a place called Malcott and uh, in in this country it, it was one of the great revivals and uh, it was what they called the primitive Methodist revival began with uh, a man called Hugh Bourne and was it William Clowes? William Clowes and Hugh Bourne and uh, just basically you know uneducated men that God used incredibly at a time when Methodism was fizzling out and at its heyday people came from all over the country uh, on the train at the bottom there made their way to the camp meetings at the top of there and it was just an out and out complete and total revival and books have been written on it it's one of those that doesn't kind of get mentioned as much as other revivals but yeah just there was an incredible revival and uh, changed the, the whole area. Anyway, the next question is kind of to do with that. So there are times in life where the most unlikely of people get saved. And certainly there's, there was account after account after account of people that got saved through the uh, the camp meetings up at the top of Malcott. And I believe it's going to happen again. I believe that there are going to be people in these last days that are the most unlikely of people that you're going to see get saved. Nobody expected this cripple ever to get healed. Nobody. That's why I believe the Holy Spirit chose this man because nobody expected it. It says that even the leaders said that this was a notable miracle. It couldn't be ignored. And I believe what happened back then in the sense is going to happen again. Now then, 
If you just want to read together Acts chapter 3 verse 11 and also Acts chapter 4 verses 13 to 14, it tells us that this man was clinging to Peter and John. And, all, and, and then again in verse 4 it tells us that he was standing with them. Now bearing in mind the connotations here come from the book of Deuteronomy that if anybody is speaking in another name apart from Yahweh they should be stoned for what they're doing basically. And what you, what's happening here is they're trying to build up a case against Peter and John. They're trying to ignore the good deed and they want them stoned to death. But this man in in chapter 3 you see him clinging to them in chapter 4 you see him standing with them there is no way that this man is not going to stand with Peter and John at this time what Peter and John did for this man through the Holy Spirit has changed his life forever and he's going to stand with them he's going to cling to them and I believe the same thing is going to happen in the last days. We might not see immense revivals. We might not see revivals that sweep through nations. But we are going to see the Lord move in, in, in extraordinary ways in the days to come. So my question to you is this. Who is the Holy Spirit prompting you to pray for? Who is the Holy Spirit prompting you to go and visit? And... Are they people that you would consider to be people that would, the type of people that would become Christians? Or are they people that actually you're not going to, and maybe you're not even praying for because in your own mind, you've already made up your mind that they're not the kind of people that are going to get saved. Is the Holy Spirit prompting you to visit somebody, maybe to do a good deed for that somebody, maybe to go and pray for that somebody, but in your own mind, you've already kind of thought down there, they are not the kind of person that's gonna come through. <laughs> because I think we all do that. I've definitely done that many times in my life and I've held back because I thought, they're not the kind of person that will get saved. Is the Holy Spirit prompting you? Are the people around you in your life that you're holding back on because you're looking and thinking, nah, it won't happen for them. Think how many times people went past that man, that certain lame man. How many times they went past him. Well, I believe this is a, a time of huge opportunities. We've got people even in this field now uh, swearing like a trooper this guy and you just think no chance but you just don't know you don't know what God's setting up so have a think about that one and Sherry if you believe there's somebody that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to go visit or go see or pray for or go and take a gift or, or a good deed or whatever share about it and let's discuss why sometimes we hold back right let's move on to a a little bit of a meatier question now, slightly more theological. Now one of the main evidences that a person is saved and that the Spirit of God is now dwelling in them, whether that be at the point of salvation or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is no doubt, and of course Jesus talks about this in the Gospel of John, in detail from John 14 through to 17 there is no doubt that the Holy Spirit illuminates the Word of God no doubt about that whatsoever that once a person has Christ in them the Holy Spirit dwelling in them the hope of glory dwelling in them uh, there is an illumination on scripture that wasn't there before I can remember at the age of 21 I flew for the first time, went on a plane for the first time, went to Lanzarote with my sister who, who'd gotten born again. And I certainly wasn't born again at that time, I was just living a ridiculously stupid life. Anyway, on the flight home, it was the first time I'd ever flown, the, uh, the left engine on the plane packed up as we were taking off made a horrible noise 
the pilot nervously announced that we were going to have to make an emergency landing and the fear honestly the fear went through me through everything like the fear not necessarily of dying it was the fear of hell and I knew I was going to hell I knew I was destined for hell and I was sitting with my sister who was born again she was carrying Jessica in her at the time and uh, and her husband Andrew and all I could think is Lord I know that you won't let this plane go down because of my sister but have mercy on me get this plane down on the ground and I will give you my life that's what I said anyway as we were coming into land there was fire engines waiting for the plane as because it was it it only got it was only flying on one engine we managed to get down and they put us up in this brand new hotel that had never been used before while the engines were being fixed and uh, I was absolutely shaken shaken to the core and I said to my sister give me your Bible give me your Bible so she lent me a Bible for that night while the engine was being and I was going through this Bible flipping through the pages could not make any sense of anything got no comfort from the scriptures whatsoever I, and you know I went to Sunday school as a kid I knew about but that I just got nothing I didn't feel any sense in the Bible that God was speaking to me nothing when I finally got saved it was two years later after that plane incident because I'm stubborn and uh, just takes me a long time to surrender I started reading the Gospel of John and within two weeks of being saved two weeks of being saved the Lord spoke to me so clearly through the Gospel of John it was like the, the Lord himself was in my room and from that point on since salvation since being born again there's always been a wonderful illumination upon the scriptures and I believe it is one of the evidences and it's you know I hear, I hear different Christians over the years say they've got no time for the Bible and you think that doesn't make sense that does not make sense the babes should be desiring the sincere milk of the gospel from from the very beginning I say all that because what you're about to see in this prayer meeting in Acts chapter 4 is a brilliant understanding of Psalm 2 as a partial fulfillment of what happened in the trial of Jesus and they they pray Psalm 2 and they say basically Psalm 2 is some kind of partial fulfillment of the judgment of Jesus and how on that day Pilate and Herod two world leaders actually came together joined together even though they were enemies they didn't even like one another and Psalm 2 is used so this is quite a juicy question really so in Acts chapter 4 verses 23 to 28 you see this prayer and you see that this prayer incorporates the Word of God that's important because we're to pray God's Word if you're praying God's Word you're already praying in agreement with God straight away so the praying Psalm 2 in the light of the first coming what I want to you to think about is in what ways does Psalm 2 and what was prayed concerning Jesus what are the parallels concerning the church in the last days remember what you see in the book of Acts everything that Jesus went through in the four Gospels you will see the church go through we follow him it's the same pattern all the way through from death burial to resurrection everything that happens to Jesus happens to those that follow him so have a think about that what are the parallels that you see in Psalm 2 and what they prayed back then and exactly what they prayed remember they even prayed concerning boldness 
How is that paralleled with the church of the last days? Have a think about it. Okay, last question, friends, and then I want to talk about having a time of prayer together. So the very last question, if you want to read Acts chapter 4, verses 29 to 37, you see the outlook of the church here is unbelievable. It, their heart, they've had a complete heart change. You don't see this prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but clearly God has done an amazing work in them. They're looking out for one another. They don't even consider their possessions to be their own anymore. They are looking out for one another and it seems to be at this time that this was the time when the church was the closest thing to heaven on earth. They, they really were looking out for one another. My question is concerning the last days, the Bible, Jesus tells us that brother will betray brother and that the love of the many will wax cold. That's really frightening. But I do believe that there will be a remnant that will stick together, very similar to the um, disciples in the early church. My question is simply this, how might that outlook that you see there, that they have for one another, be a, the absolute key for the success of the remnant in the last days. Right then, one last thing. On Sunday morning, we looked at the disciples when how they responded to the severe threat that was given to them by the leadership. And basically what they said is this, we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. What an amazing answer, what a humble answer, what a contrite answer. We cannot help. You judge between listening to you and, and, and listening to uh, God. He, he said, we cannot help, but speak the things that we have both seen and heard. Now then, in the last days, it tells us that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and that the old men will dream dreams, the young men will see visions. They will see and hear from the Lord in the last days. There will be a remnant that will. You know, the whole book of Daniel, of course, you, you don't have the book of Revelation without the book of Daniel. The two, basically almost the same book. And when you look at Daniel's friends and the, the threat that went out from Nebuchadnezzar, you know, you, you tell me the dream or you'll all die. And Daniel and his friends gathering together, they had that all night prayer meeting. They sought the mercies of God and God spoke. And Daniel, with all boldness, and humility goes to see King Nebuchadnezzar and tells him the dream. I believe that we're moving into a, a stage now where there are going to be challenges to the church that are not necessarily black and white in the Word of God. <clears throat> this vaccine uh, would be one of those challenges. You know, is there going to be a digital ID that goes with it? And if there is a digital ID that goes with it, and if, there, and if they have been using unethical ways of putting this vaccine together, it's going to create a real conundrum for the Christian. I believe it's time to seek the Lord about the future. It's time to seek the Lord about the days in which we're going straight into now. This Titanic is set to hit an iceberg and there needs to be Christians that are going to sound the alarm. So in the same way that the, the disciples, Peter and John said, we cannot help but speak the things that we've seen and heard. In the same way that Daniel went to Nebuchadnezzar with all confidence because he'd heard from the Lord, we've got to hear from the Lord in these days, friends. We've got to. Otherwise, we're going to end up with just surrounded by confusion. We need to know what the Spirit is saying to the Lord, to, to the church in these days. And I'm just suggesting, this is only a suggestion, but if we could, um, this Saturday, a group of people, those that want to, those that have a desire to, don't do it if you don't want to, there's no point. But if the Lord has given you a desire to do it, I would like us to start to pray from 12 o'clock Saturday through to 12 o'clock Sunday. We're in lockdown anyway. 12 o'clock Saturday through to 12 o'clock Sunday. 
it would be an honour if those that are listening in from various time zones, from various places would join in with this, that we seek the Lord corporately at this time concerning the things that are coming and they are coming. You know, why is this nation extended the f furlough right the way through to the end of March? What, what's going on there? We have things now that have become household terms. Lockdown has become kind of like a household term now. Nobody blinks when, when we think about things like lockdown. Nobody blinks when you think about an economic reset or a global reset. Nobody's even blinking when you say things like New World Order anymore. We are being conditioned at this time. Nobody blinks when you hear the words herd immunity. It's, these are very, very, very challenging and strange times. And if Daniel needed to seek the Lord, if the disciples could only carry on in the strength that they had because of what they'd seen and heard, you and I need to seek the Lord at this time. We really do, friends. I know we're all busy. All of us are. Even pastors are busy, you know. Everybody can find something to do to, to kind of push seeking the Lord out. But I believe it's time. And if you're listening into this, I don't know if you want to drop me a line or drop me a private message or something. If, if it is that you say, no, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to do a slot, maybe, I don't know, early, early hours in the morning or seven till 10 at night or I don't know, whatever. If you want to put yourself in, I would love to do it so that we had, have a sense that we've covered a 24 hour period where we're seeking the Lord concerning the future of this world. Praise the Lord, friends. God is with us. And since God is with us, who can be against us? God bless you. Have a lovely time in your Zoom meeting.